Attention, attention! What was discovered when a cliff in the Grand Canyon collapsed will take your breath away. A centuries-old secret has been buried beneath the surface of this famous natural attraction, and the truth behind it will astound you. Experts are working around the clock to learn more about this extraordinary discovery and what it means for our knowledge of human history. It's time to go off on an adventure that will lead you deep into the Grand Canyon and help you uncover its mysteries. Well, in simple words, you shouldn't miss this video. While on a walk through the Grand Canyon, a geology professor uncovered what has been described as a surprising discovery, the earliest recorded tracks of their sort. As a result of the collapse of a cliff in Grand Canyon National Park, a boulder with fossilized tracks was exposed, according to a news release issued by park officials. According to the findings of the experts, the fossil footprints date back approximately 313 million years. Stephen Rowland, a paleontologist at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, was quoted in a news release as saying, They are by far the oldest vertebrae tracks in Grand Canyon, which is noted for its rich fossil traces. More crucially, they are among the oldest tracks on Earth of shelled egg-laying creatures, such as reptiles, and they represent the earliest evidence of vertebrate animals walking on dunes, the researcher said. The tracks were in plain sight for many Many tourists, but they weren't noticed until a Norwegian geology professor named Alan Krill was hiking with students when he came across a boulder that contained conspicuous fossil footprints, according to park officials. The traces were discovered in Norway. According to the researchers, the footprints reveal two different creatures moving on the slope of a dune. This is significant because of the unique arrangement of footprints, which indicates that the tracks were left by two different species. The reconstruction of this animal's footfall sequence by the researchers reveals a distinctive gait called a lateral sequence walk, the Grand Canyon official said. In this gait, the legs on one side of the animal move in succession, the rear leg following by the foreleg, alternating with the movement of the two legs on the opposite side, the researcher said. According to what Roland said, they previously had no information about that. According to the officials at the park, the fossil also demonstrates the earliest known utilization of dunes by vertebrate animals. In 2016, Alan Krill, a geologist, was leading a group of students on a walk along the Bright Angel Trail in Grand Canyon National Park. When he came across it, a boulder that had fallen off the trail and was lying just off the side of the path. On the boulder were strange markings that looked like footprints. Krill, a Norwegian paleontologist who was on a visit to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, shared photographs of his discovery with Stephen Rowland, an old friend and colleague who was also a paleontologist at UNLV. The discovery made by Krill turned out to be ancient footprints that had been petrified. The discovery was presented for the first time at the annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology in 2018. Now, in a new research that was published last week in PLOS1, Roland estimates that the imprints could be as old as up to around 313 million years, making them the oldest vertebrate fossil tracks yet found in the park, according to a statement released by the National Park Service. In addition to that, as reported by Shana Montanari for the Arizona Republic, these footprints have the potential to be some of the earliest known evidence in the world of an animal that lays hard-shelled eggs. This type of animal is known as an amniote. In the announcement, Roland writes, These are by far the oldest vertebrate tracks in Grand Canyon, which is recognized for its rich fossil traces. These are by far the oldest vertebrate tracks in Grand Canyon. In addition to this, he mentions that they are among the oldest tracks on Earth of shell-egg-laying creatures such as reptiles, and that they represent the earliest evidence of vertebrate animals walking on dunes. According to information provided by Harmeet Kaur for CNN, the boulder that was found to contain tracks weighs hundreds of pounds and originated from the Manakacha Formation, which is a massive outcropping of sandstone that is approximately 314 million years old. According to George Dvorsky's research for Gizmodo, the tracks were made when the rocks became wet and were subsequently covered in sand, which helped to preserve the markings for millions of years. On its surface may be seen two distinct sets of tracks that were produced by extinct animals long ago. According to the announcement, experts were able to determine the age of the footprints to be approximately 313 million years old, give or take half a million years, by looking at prior research that determined the age of the formation. According to Rowland's interpretation of the footprints, this area was traversed by two distinct reptile species moving in a diagonal direction. According to Rowland, who was interviewed by the Arizona Republic, one of the creatures measured approximately one foot in length and uses a lateral sequence walk, which involves the left rear foot moving first, followed by the left front foot, and then the right rear foot, and so on. According to Gizmodo, 
The researchers are unable to determine with certainty if the tracks were made by two distinct creatures or the same species at different periods. The second group of tracks is moving at a pace that is a little quicker than the first. In the statement, Roland observes that living species of tetrapods, such as dogs and cats, for example, commonly utilize a lateral sequence gait while they are walking slowly. The traces on the Bright Angel Trail provide evidence that this manner of walking was used very early on in the evolution of vertebrate creatures. Before this, we did not have any knowledge of that. According to Montanari, approximately 300 million years ago, the area that is today known as Arizona was a coastal plain that featured wind-blown dunes near the equator. It has been reported by Felicia Fonseca of the Associated Press that both the creatures and the sandstone formation existed before the time of the dinosaurs. According to Roland and his co-authors in the study, this discovery also marks the earliest evidence of amniotes living in sand dunes, predating previous evidence by at least 8 million years. Mark Nebel, who oversees the paleontology program at the Grand Canyon, told the Associated Press that some of the findings from Roland's study could be construed as contentious in the future. There is a lot of dispute in the scientific world about interpreting tracks, interpreting the age of rocks, and especially interpreting what kind of animal generated these tracks, adds Nebel. Interpreting what kind of animal made these footprints is especially contentious. Nebel, however, believes that the find is an interesting one, particularly because the boulder was laying where it could be easily seen. Nebel claims that a lot of people pass by it without even noticing it's there. As scientists, our eyes have been trained. They will be more interested in it now that they are aware that there is something there. The inner gorge's igneous and metamorphic rocks were first formed over two billion years ago. Sedimentary rocks which were deposited above the aforementioned ancient strata each reveal a different chapter in the Grand Canyon area's natural past. Some 70 to 30 million years ago, plate tectonics brought about a regional uplift, leveling the area to create the high and flat Colorado Plateau. About 5 to 6 million years ago, the Colorado River finally started cutting its way to the lower elevations. The canyon widened as a result of more erosion by rivulets. Natural processes are still extending and deepening the Grand Canyon today. What causes rock formations? The development of the many tiers of rock through which the Grand Canyon winds is the starting point for the account of how the canyon came to be. About two billion years ago, when igneous and metamorphic rocks were being produced, our tale begins. After the initial formation of these bedrock structures, sedimentary rock layers were deposited atop them. The term stratigraphic column refers to the figure used by geologists to examine different layers of rock. The diagram displays the rock layers with the oldest at the bottom and the newest at the top. Hence, the oldest rocks are found at the bottom, followed by progressively younger ones as one move above. That older rocks are buried by younger ones is what geologists mean when they talk about the principle of superposition. The principle of original horizontality is another key concept. This indicates that the rock strata were all laid out in a horizontal plane. The appearance of a tilt in rock layers is the result of a geological process that took place after the rocks were first deposited. Tectonic activity on the Colorado Plateau The top layer of rock in the Grand Canyon is Kaibab limestone, which was created on the ocean floor. Now, however, the Kaibab limestone can be found at altitudes of up to 9,000 feet on the Colorado Plateau summit. How did these rocks from the ocean floor get to be so tall? Grand Canyon's creation was greatly aided by the uplift of the Colorado Plateau. The Colorado River carved its way through the flat, high plateau formed by plate tectonics. It is unclear what caused the uplift of the Colorado Plateau. Deformation of rocks is a common occurrence that geologists attribute to uplift. For instance, the uplift of the Rocky Mountains drastically compressed and twisted the rocks that make up the mountain range. The rocks of the Colorado Plateau weren't greatly changed, but they were elevated to a high-level plateau. There is ongoing research on how and why this form of uplift occurs. Several theories have been put up as to what may have caused the uplift of the Colorado Plateau, but no one knows for sure. Shallow angle subduction and sustained uplift via isostasy are the two most popular theories at the moment. South America's topography appears to be intimately related to the angle of subduction, as measured by scientists. Volcanic activity is common in regions where subduction is taking place at a normal angle. Volcanoes do not form in regions where subduction is taking place at a shallow angle. Instead, uplift along reversal faults bring up blocks of crust. Like the Andes, the Rocky Mountains and the Colorado Plateau in North America are believed to have been raised along reverse faults. Certainly, plate tectonics and a mountain-building activity dubbed the Laramide orogeny is at the beginning of the uplift tail. 
Beginning around 70 Ma during the Mesozoic era, the Laramide orogeny continued until around 40 Ma during the Cenozoic era. Several experts believe that the subduction of the Farallon Plate, located off the west coast of North America, shifted around that period. The Farallon Plate likely subducted at a deeper angle and at a faster rate than is typical. With the help of shallow angle subduction, the plate's interior was deformed some 625 miles inward from its rim. Rocky Mountain and Colorado Plateau uplifted due to severe east-west compression between two plates. The western margin of South America provides a current example of shallow angle subduction. The splitting of the Nazca plate can be seen there. The subduction is occurring at a shallow angle in one region of the plate and at a normal angle in another. It is debatable whether or not the Colorado Plateau was at its highest point at the close of the Laramide Orogeny. The Colorado Plateau may have continued to rise until the middle and late Cenozoic, according to some researchers. If this holds, then isostatic rebound might help to explain the ongoing elevation gain. Sometimes it takes a little experimentation to really grasp a concept, and in this case, it would be useful to better comprehend isostatic rebound. Get a companion to hold your arms close against your side as you push back as hard as you can. Keep this position for 30 seconds and then relax. Instruct your pal to release their grip. When the pressure was finally removed, what happened to your arms? Did your arms and legs feel like they were floating away from your sides? The crust of the earth also reacts in a similar fashion. Crust uplift occurs when erosion removes enough material to cause the crust to rise. Isostatic rebound refers to the rise of the crust after pressure has been relieved. So what exactly is a valley? And what is a canyon? A valley is a relatively low-lying tract of land that is bordered by higher land, typically mountains or hills. It's not uncommon for valleys to take on a number of different forms. The erosional features were formed by water or glacial ice, while the structural characteristics resulted from rifting. A canyon is a valley formed by erosion with exceptionally steep sides, often resulting in vertical or nearly vertical cliff cliffs. The word gorge is frequently substituted for canyon, however it typically refers to a more diminutive and narrower natural or man-made feature. The Grand Canyon is the most well-known example of a canyon formed by water erosion. The Colorado River's floods illustrate the great erosive power of water, especially when it carries large quantities of sediment and rock. The downcutting and erosion portion of this website goes into greater detail about the other factors that must be present to carve a canyon like the Grand Canyon. Rivers do not cut valleys until the other conditions are met. Through abrasion and plucking, glaciers can alter vast swaths of terrain. When sediment and rock are frozen to the bottom and sides of the glacier, abrasion develops. The stones and sediment in the glacier grind and scrape the rock surfaces as it advances. The abrasive action of the sandpaper is analogous to the way the rock surfaces are worn away over time. The glacier scourges the earth, leaving behind deep gouges, shallow striations, or even a highly polished surface. The weight of a glacier can also be used to pluck or raise big pieces of rock. Glaciers abraid the rock as they move across, in part by incorporating boulders into the ice at the glacier's base. Valleys in the shape of a U are carved by glaciers in the mountains. Views of the national parks are home to a wealth of information about glaciers. While glaciers have never formed in or around the Grand Canyon, they may have in the past and may exist presently in other national parks. Yosemite National Park in California is only one of many national parks that features U-shaped glacier valleys. When two plates of Earth's crust begin to drift apart, a rift valley forms. Divergent plate borders are the sites of the greatest plate movement. On the ocean floor, the Mid-Atlantic Range can be seen as a massive rift valley running along the middle of the Atlantic. As Africa and South America drifted apart from one another, they are creating this rift valley. Rift valleys don't necessarily occur in the ocean. The Great Rift Valley in Africa and the Rio Grande Rift in North America are two examples of rift valleys formed on land. From Chihuahua in Mexico all the way up to Leadville in Colorado, the Rio Grande Rift cuts a swath through the middle of the continent. The rift opened out somewhere between 30 and 35 million years ago, and it is still gradually becoming bigger now. Basins, or valleys, are created by rifts like the Rio Grande, and sediments gradually fill them. These basin sediments are three miles thick in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is located in the Rio Grande Rift. To what end did the Colorado River cut this massive chasm? During the past five or six million years, the Colorado River has been cutting across the landscape. Keep in mind the 1.8 billion years of age of the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon. Compared to the age of the rocks it cuts through, the canyon is a relative newcomer. The Kaibab Formation, the canyon's youngest geological layer, is 270 million years old. 
Canyon formation is referred to in the scientific community as downcutting. When a river cuts a canyon or valley into the ground and erodes away rock, this process is known as downcutting. When water levels rise, downcutting occurs. Huge rocks and boulders are also swept along with the water when a river is in full flow. To get where they're going, these rocks scrape away at the riverbed like chisels. The Colorado River cuts further into the Grand Canyon because of its steep slope, enormous volume, and dry environment. A gradient is a quantitative representation of a slope. The steeper the slope, the higher the gradient. While sledding, a steeper slope equates to a more thrilling ride. A higher or steeper gradient in a river's bed results in a more rapid flow. Heavy boulders and rocks can be carried by a river with a strong current. Although a steep gradient is not particularly unusual for rivers, it is undeniably significant because it increases a river's force. The Colorado River travels 277 miles through the Grand Canyon, losing nearly 2,000 feet in altitude. A river's ability to carry large rocks and travel at high speeds during floods is greatly enhanced by the steep slope at which the river flows. To put it another way, the Colorado River is really active right now. Sediment is easily transported by a river with a large volume. Colorado's volume is quite low when compared to that of larger rivers like the Mississippi and the Nile, but when floods occur, its volume grows dramatically. The width and depth of the Colorado River as it flows through the Grand Canyon are on average 300 feet and 40 feet respectively. 12,000 to 15,000 cubic feet per second is the typical flow rate. It is possible for 300,000 cubic feet of water to flow every second during a flood because of the increasing volume of water. Put yourself in the path of 300,000 basketballs, each one roughly a cubic foot in volume, and imagine how fast they would be moving past you at that rate. As glaciers melted in the Rocky Mountains towards the end of the last ice age, some geologists speculate that as much as a million cubic feet per second of water could have been flowing down the Colorado River. Arid environments experience rapid mechanical weathering. There is less soil erosion in wetter climates because vegetation covers more ground. Extreme dryness causes the earth to erode away, revealing bare rock. The exposed rocks are more vulnerable to weathering from rain, temperature swings from day to day, and ice wedging in the winter. Due to the rock's exposure and weathering, rivers in arid regions can more easily carve through it. Degradation from the elements and erosion are continuous processes. In a few million years, what might the Grand Canyon look like if humans decided to go back there? To begin with, it would grow significantly larger, to the point that we might no longer be able to see across it. The Grand Canyon's width is mostly the result of erosion caused by water draining from higher elevations and joining the Colorado River lower down. Erosion will persist so long as water from rain and melting snow continues to flow in these tributaries. The Grand Canyon may be slightly deeper in a few million years, but it isn't deepening anywhere near as quickly as it is widening. The igneous and metamorphic rocks that the river is downcutting through are significantly harder than the sedimentary rocks that sit on top of them. Also, the river's gradient has lowered, weakening its ability to overcome the tough rock. Last but not least, the river is only 2,400 feet above sea level and it passes by Phantom Ranch, a famous hiking site in the canyon. In light of the fact that the ocean floor serves as the ultimate base level for all rivers and streams, the Colorado River will complete its downcutting once it reaches that level. Because of Glen Canyon Dam, the Colorado River's volume as it flows through the Grand Canyon no longer ebbs and flows dramatically throughout the year. Before Glen Canyon Dam was built, the Colorado River's flow volume would drop to as little as 500 to 1,000 CFS by late summer. The river would then swell to 100,000 CFS or more by late spring when the snow in the Rocky Mountains would begin to melt. These spring floods were once used for downcutting due to the massive volumes of sediment they could carry and their ability to sweep enormous rocks downstream. That's all for the video today. We will be right back. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel.